Hello, my name is Aruna Sundi, and in this presentation, we'll go over some best practices and guidelines when reporting your XAS and imaging data, and talk about some things to look out for when reviewing XAS data in the literature. This presentation will be split into two parts. In the first half, we'll talk about how to effectively communicate your data in publications or presentations. In the second half, we'll look at examples of XAS and imaging data in the literature, and highlight some common mistakes that are often made when reporting data. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to understand what experimental detail should be included in a publication, be able to clearly present your data in a compelling story, and judge the quality of data presentation and the resulting conclusions when reading the literature. So let's jump into part one, communicating your data in publications and presentations. We'll start by going over the details that should be included in the method section of your paper. It's important to provide enough details for readers to be able to understand your results, reproduce your experiments, and compare your results with their own data. You can think of this and the following slide as a checklist of details that should be present in your methods section. First, let's look at the details that should be included with each component of your experiment. The measurement starts with X-ray generation. You should specify which synchrotron and which beamline was used to collect the data. You should also state the ring conditions, like current and energy, and the source magnet that was used to generate the X-rays. Next, provide details on the X-ray energy and optics. What monochromator crystal and orientation were you using to select the X-ray energy? What mirrors or focusing optics were used? Did you detune the beam? And if so, how much and at what energy? How did you calibrate the energy? Did you collect a calibration standard along with your sample measurements? For imaging experiments, you should specify the X-ray spot size and list out the collection energies if you're doing multi-energy maps. Next, provide details about detection. Was this a transmission or fluorescence experiment? Did you use ionization chambers? And if so, what gas were they filled with? If this is a fluorescence experiment, specify the type of detector. For a HERFT experiment, include details on the analyzer crystals and the fluorescence line used to collect the data. Finally, you should include details on sample preparation and measurement conditions. In addition to how you prepared the sample, you should describe the sample holder, both the material and the thickness of the holder. Did your sample require special handling? For instance, if it was an air-sensitive sample that was prepared in a glove box, how did you transfer it to the beamline? What was the measurement environment? For instance, did you measure at low temperatures in a cryostat? Or did you do an in-situ measurement with a controlled sample environment? And if you were doing an in-situ experiment in which you measured the sample under a series of different conditions, describe the steps of that experiment and what type of measurement you did at each step. For more information about data collection and instrumentation, I'll refer you to this video on the SSRL Summer School YouTube channel. Next, let's move to the data processing side. First, specify the software that you used for your data analysis. When discussing absorbance data, how many replicate scans did you average for each spectrum? How did you calibrate the energy? In particular, what feature did you use for calibration and what energy did you set it to? How did you assess if the sample was damaged by the beam? For XAVS analysis, how did you define the background function that you subtracted to get your XAVS data? If you performed linear combination fits, explain what standards you used and what energy range you performed the fit over. If you analyzed features in the zanes, explain how you defined your background and peak shapes. When modeling XAVS data, describe the structure that you used and how you generated the theoretical absorber backscatter contributions, the chi-k. Did you perform the fit in k-space or r-space? What k-weightings do you use? And what k and r ranges were used for your fits? Which parameters were kept fixed and which ones did you fit? Finally, how did you determine the value of S0 squared? Did you fix it to a specific value, or did you determine it using a standard? If you're presenting imaging data, you should explain how you identified different chemical species. Describe how Zane spectra fits were used to create multi-energy maps. Describe the filter on the data and any particle statistics that may be relevant. Lastly, imaging experiments are often accompanied by Zane's measurements, so the same details when analyzing absorption data apply here. For more information about performing these data analyses, I refer you to the tutorials on the SSRL Summer School YouTube channel. 
Next, we'll talk about how to prepare figures for a manuscript and what details should be included. Here you can see two good examples of Zane's figures. To start, both figures cover the basic qualities that should be present in all plots, not just XAS data. The axes are labeled with the correct units in parentheses, the font size is large and easy to read, and the lines are bold and easy to see. In both figures, the element and the edge have been clearly specified. The spectra are differentiated clearly, either vertically offset in the image on the left or with the different colors in the image on the right. The spectra have been clearly labeled with the sample names, either in the figure itself or in the caption. When relevant, the spectra of some standard compounds have been included for comparison. In the plot on the right, we can see an inset with an expanded view of the pre-edge, which clearly highlights the difference in this important feature between the samples. Lastly, the Zane spectra are plotted over the appropriate energy range, so you can clearly see the features in the rising edge. Next, let's look at linear combination fits. In this example on top, you can very clearly see the experimental measurements, the linear combination fits, and the components that were included in the fit. The spectra for the components have been scaled according to their weights, which makes it very easy to see their contributions. The plots also show the R factor, so you can judge the goodness of fit not only by visual inspection, but also using this statistical parameter. Another way linear combination fit data may be shown is like this on the bottom. In this case, the changes in the zanes of a sample as a function of a process parameter, in this case temperature, are clearly shown using different colors and arrows to highlight the direction of change. In the right panel, we can see the results of the linear combination fitting and how each component contributes as a function of temperature. In some cases, both types of figures are relevant, and if the paper has a figure like the one at the bottom, it should also show a figure like the one at the top, which picks out a few of these spectra along with this transition and shows the quality of the linear combination fit. Now let's look at some XAVS data. We see two nice examples of XAVS data here. Both plots clearly show the measured data and XAVS fits. The multiple spectra are offset either vertically or on different axes, so the fits for each can be clearly seen. Details about the sample and the model used in the fit are included in the figure or in the caption. The fits are shown both in k-space and r-space, and in general you should include plots showing both fitting spaces, either in the main text or supporting information. The plots show an appropriate r-range. In general, from 0 to 6 angstroms is a good rule of thumb. The only thing I would suggest to add here are units to the y-axis. Chi k itself is unitless, but k has units of inverse angstroms, so the k cubed weighted xavs, which are plotted here, should have units of angstroms to the minus 3. When you take the Fourier transform, you introduce another inverse angstrom, so the Fourier transform in this case should have units of angstroms to the power of minus 4. To go along with your xavs plots, you should include a table of the parameters used to model the data. Your table should include all of the fit and fix parameters in the model, you should include a goodness of fit statistic. All of the parameters should have the correct units listed. Both the coordination number and the scattering paths should be specified. Distances are reported with the appropriate level of precision, which is to two decimal points when reporting distances in angstroms. All the fit parameters have the uncertainties reported. And lastly, the value of S0 squared has been stated in the caption. Let's now look at some best practices when reporting imaging data. In this figure, the researchers were characterizing different sulfur chemical species in a heterogeneous sample. In this example, you can see that all the maps in the figure on the right include a scale bar. There is also an abundance scale bar included here. The figure includes an optical image, which is useful when the sample has distinct features like you see here. Regions of interest are labeled, in this case S and T for skeleton and tissue regions. These labels allow me to clearly see where these corresponding Zane spectra for the tissue and skeleton were collected. Lastly, the Zanes include a linear combination fit of all the standard spectra to the data, which clearly shows how these species maps were derived from the Zanes data. Lastly, I want to differentiate between presenting data in a publication versus an oral or poster presentation. In a publication, the reader can spend as much time as they need to look at your data and digest the information. In a presentation, you only have a limited amount of time, so you need to present your data clearly with a focus on the important parts. There are two questions you should keep in mind when giving a presentation. First, who is your audience? 
the talk that you give to a group of spectroscopy experts will be very different from the talk that you give to a broader scientific audience, and your presentation should reflect that. Second, what is your story? Always keep in mind how the XAS or imaging data contributes to the overall story you're trying to tell and emphasize those parts in your presentation. I'll give you an example of presenting XAVS results to a general audience. Here we're looking at the XAVS of a catalyst consisting of molybdenum oxide and rhodium nanoparticles. We're looking at the molybdenum K edge XAVS of the sample measured under three different conditions. In the as prepared state, the molybdenum is oxidic. Once the catalyst is reduced, we have metallic molybdenum substituted into the surface of the rhodium nanoparticles. And under reaction conditions, we have MOOH species present in the rhodium nanoparticle surface. And you can see a top-down view of the surface that we infer from the XFs data in this image on the right. So let's look at some features of this style of presentation. First, the peaks in the XFs are labeled with the relevant scattering paths. So even if the audience is not very familiar with XFs, they can see where the data and the results come from. The figure includes an arrow here to highlight an important change in the XFs data. The spectra are color coordinated with the relevant conclusions. The presentation uses animations to explain these multiple data sets one at a time. The conclusions list out only the important coordination numbers and bond lengths. Many times it's not necessary to include a full table of XFs fit parameters in your presentation, since it can often be hard for the audience to digest that much information. Lastly, a picture can often communicate your results better than a verbal explanation including a picture of the structure that is determined from your XFs data, can make your results very clear to the audience. So that concludes part one. In the next part, we'll look at examples of data presentation in the literature. We'll highlight some common mistakes in both the data presentation and analysis, and you'll see how we can judge the quality of the analyses and conclusions based on how the data has been presented. In this section, I'll ask how each example could be improved and give multiple choice answers. I encourage you to pause the video after I show the choices and decide for yourself how we could improve each example. Here's our first example. The caption tells us that we're looking at the Zane spectra of a ruthenium foil in A and a ruthenium TiO2 sample in B. How could this figure be improved? A, they should decrease the energy range over which the spectra are plotted. B, they should add a label to the y-axis. C, the element and the edge should be specified or D, all of the above. Pause the video now and try to answer the question. The answer is D. The axis should be labeled as normalized absorption. The caption or the figure itself should specify that this is the ruthenium K edge. And importantly, when showing the zanes, you do not need to plot this far in energy. The energy range that you plot can vary and depends on where there are zanes features of interest. And that is element specific. In general, though, the maximum energy is on the order of tens of EV above the edge, not hundreds as you see in this image. Next, we're looking at the Zane spectra collected in situ during temperature programmed carburization of a cobalt catalyst with different alkali promoters. We have axes for energy, absorptivity, and temperature. How could this be improved? In this case, I hope the answer is very obvious. This style of 3D stacked plotting makes it impossible to see changes in the zanes. I don't know if the edge energy is changing, I can't see any differences in the shape of the rising edge or zanes features, and I can't tell if there's any changes in the pre-edge region. If you're plotting multiple zane spectra, I highly recommend using the style that I showed previously in this presentation. I'll also note that absorptivity is the incorrect y-axis label. It should be normalized absorption. Next, we're looking at an in-situ spectra collected for a copper sample. It starts in this oxygen-activated state, goes through a series of intermediates, and ends in this final ammonia-adsorbed state. How could this be improved? A, different colors should be used to distinguish the intermediate spectra. B, another panel should be included showing a linear combination fit of these intermediate spectra. C, the changes in feature B should be highlighted in an inset, the same way the changes in feature A are highlighted. Or D, is this figure fine and no changes are necessary? Pause now and try to work it out. The answer is D. This is an example of excellent communication in a nice figure. The spectra and axes are clearly and correctly labeled. 
The color changing arrows clearly highlight the changes in the spectra. Feature A, which is hard to see at full scale, is magnified in the inset. While some of these options, like using different colors, would be fine, it's not necessary if the figure clearly shows the changes. Also, including further analyses like linear combination fitting may or may not be relevant, so it depends on what conclusions you're trying to draw from the data. Now let's look at some XAVs examples. Here we're looking at the Fourier transform XAVs of some cobalt samples in fresh and pre-treated states. How could this be improved? A. Plotting the standard spectra is unnecessary. B. The plotted distance range to 10 angstroms is too high. C. The plot should show the XAVs fits. D. The y-axis should include units and k-weighting. Or E. Is the answer B through D. The answer is E. We already talked about the basics, like showing XFs fits and including units and k-weighting. The mistake I want to point out in this example is the distance range up to 10 angstroms. Recall from the XFs equation that the intensity is proportional to 1 over r squared and also has a term that decays exponentially with r. So there's no need to plot this far out in distance. Plotting up to 6 angstroms is a good rule of thumb, and in some cases it may be appropriate to plot less than that. This is an example of cobalt k-edge exavs plotted in k-space and r-space. How could this be improved? A, the large peak in the Fourier transform below one angstrom should not be there. B, the k-weighting, axis labels, and exavs fits should be included. C, the k-space plot shows an insufficient range. D, is it both A and B? Or E, is it all of the above? The answer is D. We've already talked about the basic details that are listed in answer B. The additional point I want to make here is that you should not have scattering paths shorter than one angstrom. Metal carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen bonds will certainly be longer than this. As a reference, the carbon-carbon bond length in acetylene, which is a very short carbon-carbon bond, is 1.2 angstroms. Seeing a large peak below one angstrom indicates that there may be an issue in the background subtraction from the exabs. Next, we're looking at the exavs of a copper compound with nitrogen ligands, and the goal is to compare copper nitrogen bond distances across a series of similar compounds. You can see the exavs data and fit on the left, and a table of fit parameters on the right. How could this be improved? A, the data should not be fit out to nearly five angstroms. B, there's a difference between the data and the fit around 4.8 angstroms, which indicates that the fit is not representing the data well enough. C, the coordination numbers have been fixed, but they should really be fit parameters. Or D, is this fine and no changes are necessary? The answer is A. You should be wary of overfitting your data and fitting beyond what is needed to get the information you need. If the goal is to compare copper nitrogen bond distances, then there's no reason to fit out to almost five angstroms. You should avoid fitting to large R values unless it provides you additional information that is relevant to the structure you are characterizing or the questions you want to answer. Next, I have the exhaves of metallic cobalt nanoparticles that were collected in situ at 250 degrees. The model used to fit the first shell was generated from a face-centered cubic cobalt metal structure. You can see the fit parameters in this table, and the conclusion I want to draw is that the cobalt nanoparticles have an FCC structure. Is this okay, or could this be improved? A, the coordination number of 10.8 is too low for an FCC structure. B, this XAVs model is not sufficient to conclude an FCC structure. C, the disorder parameter sigma squared is unrealistically large. Or D, is the conclusion fine and no changes are necessary? The answer is B. Metallic cobalt actually has two stable phases, a face-centered cubic structure and a hexagonal close-pack structure. Uh, both of these are close-pack structures with a first shell coordination number of 12 for a bulk metal. Therefore, the first shell fit alone cannot distinguish between these. However, these structures differ at higher distances. I'm showing here the scattering paths generated from the HCP and FCC cobalt metal structures. And you can see that in the FCC structure, there's a single scattering contribution at 4.34 angstroms, which is not present in the HCP structure. 
So this is an example where I may actually want to model out to four and a half or five angstroms if I want to conclude an FCC structure. This is also an example where XOPS may not be the right technique for the question you're trying to answer. In this case, it would make more sense to directly characterize the phases using a technique like in situ X-ray diffraction. When you're looking at XAS data in the literature, always think about whether the conclusions are justified or if the authors are making a statement that's not fully supported by their model. Next, we're looking at the ruthenium k edge zanes in the top panel and XAVs in the bottom panel. How could this be improved? A, the XAVs fit should include this feature at four angstroms, which is not currently fit. B, the zanes window that's been plotted is too narrow. C, the inset of the k-space XAV stops at a minimum of k equals two, but it should show down to k equals zero. Or D, is this fine and no changes are necessary? The answer is D. The Zane spectra have been plotted clearly, with arrows highlighting an important difference between the spectra. The measured and fit XAVs are labeled well and fit appropriately. Now let's look at a table of XAVs fit parameters. The sample has been measured in four states, summarized here in the first column, and we can see the fit parameters here. How could this be improved? And for this question, select all that apply. A, the delta R values, which are the difference between the guess bond distance and the fit bond distance should not be negative. B, the delta R parameter should not be reported. C, the errors in coordination number are too large. D, paths with coordination number close to zero should not be included. E, there's too high precision in the reported distances. Or F, the delta E zero values have not been reported. The answers are B, D, E, and F. The most important point is answer D. Keep in mind that XF's fitting is a purely mathematical procedure. The software does not have any chemical intuition and is just trying to find parameters that minimize the sum of the residual squares between the data and the model. The XF's intensity is proportional to the coordination number. So when the software fits a value this close to zero, it means the scattering path is not present in a sufficient amount for you to be able to detect it. It is up to you to use your chemical knowledge and include or exclude paths that make sense. We also have E as an answer. This is a very common mistake. As I said before, the XF's bond distances should be reported to two decimal places if you're using units of angstroms. Your XF's measurement will almost certainly not have greater precision than this. Lastly, the delta R values can be useful for you when you're fitting your data. For instance, if you see a very large delta R value, it means that the software is significantly distorting your guess structure in order to fit the data. And it's an indication that you may not have the appropriate model. However, once you have a good fit that makes chemical sense, you do not need to report this parameter. Next, I have a compound that consists of copper bound to two carbon atoms and two nitrogen atoms. There's more to these ligands, but in this case, I just want to do a first shell fit. I run DFT calculations and I get the bond lengths listed here. I then fit the first shell XAVs using two copper nitrogen and two copper carbon scattering paths. How could this be improved? A, the bond distances should be fixed to the computed values. B, the four scattering paths should be fit using a single path. C, the different copper nitrogen bond lengths that I get from my calculation should be fit as separate paths. Or D, is this fine and no changes are necessary? The answer is B. A difference in bond length of 0.04 angstroms between two similar scatterers, meaning atomic number Z plus or minus one, cannot be distinguished within the resolution of the XAVs measurement. You can use this formula to determine the minimum resolution. K and R are parameters related by the Fourier transform, which means they must satisfy the uncertainty principle. In this case, the product of delta K and delta R must be greater than or equal to pi over two. You can see from my fitting window that k is fit from 2 to 12 inverse angstroms, so delta k is equal to 10. That means the minimum difference in bond length between two similar scatterers that can be distinguished with this measurement is pi over 20, or roughly 0.15 angstroms. In this case, the difference of 0.04 angstroms between my copper nitrogen and copper carbon scatterers is too small for me to resolve using this XAVs measurement, so the four scatterers should be fit as a single path. Now let's move to some imaging examples. Here we have maps of the fluorescence of different elements from two samples. Panels A through F are one sample and panels G through K are another sample. How could this be improved? 
A, scale bar should be included in all the images. B, all the images should be the same size. You can see that E is slightly narrower than A and I is slightly taller than J. C, the elements for each map should be indicated on the image or D, all of the above. The answer is D. These multi-panel images are much easier to understand if scale bars and the elements are included in each map. Even if the elements are included in the caption, it's much easier to see if they're shown on the figure. Of course, if you're showing maps, they should definitely be the same size, otherwise your scale bars are meaningless. And in a situation like this, where they're mapping out different elements, it can be useful to have an overlaid elemental map showing the distribution of the different elements within the sample. Next, we have the image of a sediment sample with insets that include Zane spectra at the specified points. How could this be improved? A, the Zane spectra should be overlaid in a single figure to better show the differences. B, the lines indicating the spectrum positions cover up too much of the map. C, there should be a key showing which species are red, blue, and green. D, an optical image of the sample should be included alongside this figure. E, is it A through C? Or F, is it all of the above? The answer is E. The subtle changes in the Zane spectra are much easier to see if the spectra are overlaid. When you overlay the spectra, it would then be too busy to have lines to all these different points, so a better option would be to use small circles or arrows with letters on the image showing the spot where each spectrum was collected. And lastly, I cannot tell from this image what species the red, blue, and green colors correspond to. Even if this information is included in the caption, it's better to have a self-contained figure with that information, and there's space at the top next to the scale bar where this could be included. Okay, our final example. Here we have an optical image of a sample, and the X-ray fluorescence maps are overlaid on top of this image. The Zanes is shown in the figure on the left. How could this be improved? A, the Zane spectra should be overlaid, not offset. B, the XRF intensity map should be its own figure and not overlaid with the optical image. C, the spot location where the Zanes was collected should be shown on the image. Or D, is this fine and no changes are necessary? The answer is C. For the most part, this image is very good, and the style of overlaying the fluorescence map on top of the optical image is a nice way to display the data. However, when you have a heterogeneous sample like this, it's important to specify where on the sample the Zane spectra were collected, since the Zanes will clearly be different from one point to another. To summarize, we talked about best practices when writing your paper and preparing figures. The details about data collection and analysis must be sufficient for others to understand reproduce, and compare your results with their own. As much as possible, figures should stand alone. Ideally, the reader should be able to look at your figure, read the caption, and draw their own conclusions and interpretations of the data without having to dig for details in the text of the manuscript. When designing your figures, highlight important aspects of your data. For instance, we saw examples where important Zane's pre-edge features were magnified in an inset. Next, remember that papers and presentations are different forms of communication, and figures that work for one may not be good for the other. Think about how to best tell your story in each context. Finally, when in doubt, ask. The instructors at SSRL would be happy to chat about data presentation and answer any of your questions. So with that, I'd like to thank my coworkers listed here for their help and feedback on this presentation. You can reach out to Joss or Riti with any questions you may have, and I thank you for your attention.